Hello, good morning. Morning prayer will begin momentarily. You have a prayer book, get that out. If you have uh, the scripture inserts that many of you have, uh, you can have those available. And uh, if you don't have those, if you'd like to grab a Bible so you can follow along, you can, but you don't need to. So I'll get ready for everyone to get settled for a moment and uh, take a breath and we'll get ready to worship God in this way. I want to extend welcome to you on behalf of all the people of St. Luke's Episcopal Church in Billings, Montana. I'm their rector, Melinda St. Clair, and uh, it's my privilege to be with you in this physically distanced way this morning as we worship God with morning prayer. Um, and so please turn to page 77 in your prayer book. Page 77. Let us begin. Christ has entered not into a sanctuary made with hands, a copy of the true one, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. It has always been my habit to omit, to skip the confession of sin during Easter season, and so we're going to skip it today. I want to have you turn to page 80, where we will continue with the Invitatory and Psalter. On page 80. I invite you to please say the responses with me, out loud, even if you're by yourself, don't feel silly. I'm here by myself, too. Uh, I will say them, but I invite you to say the parts that are for all of us to say out loud. And so beginning on page 80, Lord, open our lips, and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. Okay. Alleluia, the Lord is risen indeed. Come, let us adore him. Uh, we begin today with Psalm 116, portion of it. Uh, if you don't have the insert, if you have your prayer book, it is on page 759. And Psalm 116, we will read verses 1 through 3 and then skip to verses 10 through 17. Psalm 116, 1 through 3, skipping to verse 10. Please say it with me. I love the Lord because he has heard the voice of my supplication, because he has inclined his ear to me whenever I called upon him. The cords of death entangled me. The grip of the grave took hold of me. I came to grief and sorrow. Then I called upon the name of the Lord. O Lord, I pray you save my life. How shall I repay the Lord for all the good things he has done for me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his servants. O oh Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant and the child of your handmaid. You have freed me from my bonds. I will offer you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call upon the name of the Lord. I will 
fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. In the courts of the Lord's house, in the midst of you, O Jerusalem. Hallelujah. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Please uh, turn to page 87, and we will say together canticle number 11, which is the third song of Isaiah. Canticle 87, or canticle 11 on page 87. Let us say it together. Arise, shine, for your light has come and the glory of the Lord has dawned upon you. For behold, darkness covers the land, deep gloom enshrouds the people. But over you the Lord will rise, and his glory will appear upon you. Nations will stream to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawning. Your gates will always be open, by day or night they will never be shut. They will call you the city of the Lord, the Zion of the Holy One of Israel. Violence will no more be heard in your land, ruin or destruction within your borders. You will call upon your walls salvation, you will call your walls salvation, and your, all your portals praise. The sun will no more strike, be your light by day. The night will not, you will not need the brightness of the moon. The Lord will be your everlasting light, and your God will be your glory. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Our first reading today is from the Acts of the Apostles, Acts chapter 2, beginning with verse 14a, but then skipping ahead to verse 36. So a reading from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2. Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Let the entire house of Israel know, know with certainty that God was, has made him both Lord and Messiah, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ so that your sins may be forgiven and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, for your children and for all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. And he testified with many other arguments and exhorted them, saying, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation, so that those who welcomed his message were baptized. And that day about 3,000 persons were added. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I got ahead of myself with that first canticle. So we're going to uh, go ahead and do the second reading, which we should do the canticle right now. And uh, we'll do the next canticle after this second reading. Uh, the second reading is from the first letter of Peter, uh, chapter 1, verses 17 through 23. So we continue to hear from Peter in his first letter, chapter 1, verse 17. If you invoke as father the one who judges all people impartially according to their deeds, live in reverent fear during the time of your exile. You know that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your ancestors, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without defect or blemish. He was destined before the foundation of the world but was revealed at the end of the ages for your sake. Through him you have come to trust in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, 
so that your faith and hope are set on God. Now that you have purified your souls by your obedience to the truth, so that you may have genuine mutual love, love one another deeply from the heart. You have been born anew, not of perishable, but of imperishable seed, through the living and enduring word of God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now let us turn turn to page 89 in your prayer book. We're going to do canticle number 12, which is a song of creation. But we're going to this day do the section number two on page 89. Uh, the Song of Creation about the earth and its creatures. Join me in saying this canticle. Let the earth glorify the Lord, praise him and highly exalt him forever. Glorify the Lord, O mountains and hills, and all that grows upon the earth. Praise him and highly exalt him forever. Glorify the Lord, O springs of water, seas and streams, O whales and all that move in the waters. All birds of the air glorify the Lord. Praise him and exalt him for ever, highly exalt him forever. Glorify the Lord, O beasts of the wild, and all you flocks and herds. Men and women everywhere glorify the Lord. Praise him and highly exalt him forever. The Gospel reading for today is from the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 24, verses 13 through 35. Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, beginning with verse 13. The Gospel according to Luke. Now on that same day, Two of Jesus' disciples were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. He said to them, What are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place in these days? He asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb, and found it just as the women had said. But they did not see him. <coughs> <clears throat> then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are! How slow of heart to believe that all, the prophet, all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and enter, then enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening and the day is now over. So he went to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took bread 
blessed and broke it and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. Then they said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road, and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I want to talk to you today about this story that we call the road to Emmaus. Uh, actually, I, I would rather think of it as the walk to Emmaus because they were walking, Jesus was walking, they were going where they went, and most of the people in that time in our world walked everywhere they went. It was only a few that could have horses or camels or donkeys, but most of the people walked, and we know that Jesus walked and walked. And there are a lot of images in scripture of walking uh, and that being a euphemism for being in the presence of God. For instance, in the Garden of Eden, we say that God walked in the garden with them. Or we hear that uh, prophets walked in holiness and righteousness all their days. And that meant that, that meant that when we say someone was walking in holiness and righteousness, or walking with God, being in the presence of God. And so there's that old hymn that some people love and some people hate. Uh, you know, I come to the garden alone and, you know, and he walks with me and he talks with me. You know that old hymn. I won't make you listen to me sing the whole thing. Um, and so I like to think of this as walking to Emmaus. And as they're walking along, uh, Jesus, they don't know who he is, but they're sad and they're dejected and they're like, well, we thought he was the one, but he was killed and this is terrible and we don't want to do So they're going home, they're hanging their heads, you know, everything is terrible, horrible and awful. Uh, and Jesus shows up and walks with them and says, hey, what you guys talking about? I, I read something that uh, in, the, in the original language, he said something like, uh, what words are you tossing back and forth to each other? And they said, well, are you the only one who doesn't know what's going on around here? Don't you, have you been watching the news? Don't you know that there's been a crisis? Something horrible has happened. They've killed the one we thought was the Messiah. They were rioting. And now the followers are all hiding out. Don't you know what's been going on? And he says, look, you foolish people. How can you not see that this is exactly what was supposed to happen? And that it's a good thing. And he proceeds to interpret the things in their scriptures, what we call the Old Testament and the Hebrew scriptures. He interprets to them all the stuff in the scripture, the Hebrew scriptures that are about himself. The messianic prophecies, if you will. And, and uh, the interesting word there is he interpreted the scriptures to them. And I think that flies in the face of literalism that we Episcopalians rail against. But anyway... That's a different sermon. But I want to, I think about walking. And he gets, he gets to their home. In that culture, I, uh, I've read, it was like, you know, you were expected to extend hospitality to strangers and travelers. That's what you were expected to do. But at the same time, they were expected to say no thank you and keep moving on. Most of the time, not really accepting your hospitality. That was also part of the culture. And so when it says Jesus began to walk on, that's what he was doing because he was waiting for them to insist. That's what they would do. Then once the person, they'd instill the, uh, the hospitality and the person says no thanks, they insist. And then the person would come and stay with them. And so they were insisting that Jesus come. But when he gets there and he sits down in their home at their invitation with their food and he becomes the host and he takes the bread, he blesses the bread and he gives it back to them to eat. And in doing that, that act, what we might consider a sacramental act, 
that simple meal of table fellowship became a sacred event. And their eyes were opened and they, they recognized who Jesus was. And you know what? Boom, immediately he vanished. Isn't, isn't that the way? Whenever we have an aha moment or we think we see Christ in our midst, we think we see it's a God thing. Boom, it's so fleeting and it's over. And we have to reflect on it later to really come to understand what we just experienced. Uh, uh, recognizing Christ in our midst is a fleeting thing because then this happens, Jesus disappears. That happens in the post-resurrection appearances. He appears, he eats, and he goes. But when that happened, then they started thinking back. They started remembering what he was talking about on the road. Gosh, weren't we? Weren't our hearts burning? I mean, weren't our hearts burning? Weren't maybe we could think the Holy Spirit was in there, but they they didn't know that. Ah, uh, we were on fire for God. I mean, we could recognize what He was saying was true. He was opening Scripture to us in a way that made our hearts burn, and they went, "Yeah, so it's true." And they got up right then and went straight back seven miles or so to to tell what they had just experienced, and they found the group saying. Yeah, he's appeared. We've seen him. It's true. And they said, well, yeah, we saw him too. And let me tell you what happened. Now, he's not celebrating the Eucharist with him. This wasn't like the Last Supper. It was a simple meal shared with others in which Jesus eats and God is revealed. My Old Testament professor used to like to say, and uh, Ellen Davis uh, used to tell us, that every time Jesus eats, God is revealed. Every time Jesus eats, God is revealed. And so I, that's your homework. If you want to go back and scour through your scriptures and see if God is revealed every time Jesus eats. I think I do believe that. But this, this walking in this table fellowship tells me that the risen Lord meets us in ordinary experiences. Uh, on the road, and we all have our own Emmaus journeys. These these people who were wanted to be believers, but didn't didn't see things turn out the way they thought. They were they were going back to Emmaus to shelter in place, to get away from the horribleness they had just seen in Jerusalem, to go back and hole up and be unhappy and sad and try to figure out what next to do. And we all have our Emmauses that we retreat to when things get really horrible. And for us, maybe it's isolating in our homes and shutting everybody out. Uh, maybe it's uh, our Emmaus can be retreating into alcohol or drugs or food or sex or going out and being in big crowds and listening to the rabble rousers and music and dancing and all of those things. Shopping, which maybe in themselves are not necessarily inherently bad, but we do it to retreat from the horribleness we just have experienced in our daily lives. And we have to know that even in those places where we retreat to get away from the world, Jesus shows up and journeys with us unexpectedly and often we don't recognize that that's Jesus in our midst. But we have to know that he's there. Now, I read something uh, that, that made a lot of sense to me. I want to share that with you. And it's about three different ways of knowing an event. Three different ways of knowing an event that we are involved in. And the first one is rehearsal in that anticipating the event, uh, rehearsing, like when we know the event's getting going to happen and we're thinking about what it's going to be like and what we're going to do in it and how we're going to respond, we're rehearsing this event in our minds. And it often doesn't go the way we rehearsed. But one way to know an event is anticipating it, trying to predict what's going to happen when we when we get into the actual event that's one the first way of knowing an event 
The second way is at the time of the event, being actually involved in it. And then our understanding is cluttered by the confusion of so much happening so fast. We're hindered in understanding when we're in the midst of the event because it's a lot going on and it we're involved in, it's chaotic maybe, and we don't really know, and it's not what we rehearsed, and so we don't really understand. We just have to be in the experience. That's the second way of knowing an event. And the third way of knowing is through remembrance. And remembering back, thinking back over the event that we just went through. In our modern language, we would say we've got to process it or we've got to unpack it. But it's in the remembering of the event that we come to understand. Because when we rehearse it ahead of time, we're hindered in our understanding because of the ability to believe that it's really going to happen. Okay, Jesus said, I'm going to get crucified. We can't really believe that's going to happen. I'm going to rise again. We don't really think that's going to happen. So we don't really understand what he's talking about. At the time, there's just too much going on. We don't know what's going on. We don't know what's happening. I don't understand. But like these, these sojourners on their walk back to Emmaus, they remembered, and after Jesus had been revealed, and they think back, weren't our hearts burning? Wasn't he opening the scriptures to us? Our understanding is opened up when the nonsense of the rehearsal and the busyness of the event is over, and that gives way to recognition and realization and understanding. We're kind of in that same boat right now. We've got events going on in our world that first, we didn't really think they were going to happen. Oh, this won't be so bad. This pandemic, uh, it will pass. We're just going to be sick for a little while. Uh, our lives will be disrupted for a little bit of a while. We're rehearsing what's going to happen in the pandemic. And we can't really believe it's going to be as horrible as we, as people say it's going to be. So we don't understand what's going to happen, what is happening, not going to, what is happening. And then we're in the midst of it, which we are right now, and it's chaotic. And all things are new. We're having to figure out new ways of doing things. We're having to stop doing stuff that we were used to doing before. And, you know, people are dying. People are getting sick. We don't, you know, people are saying different things. It's chaotic. It's crazy. It's just something that's so hard to wrap our minds around. We don't have time to sit and process the way our world has changed, the way we're changed through this event that we're living through right now. And so many of us may want to retreat to our Emmaus by going out. Oh, you know, everything's open now. Let's go to the casinos. Let's go party. Let's go back to church. But we don't understand when we do that. We don't understand what's really happening. And so when we have time to reflect, when we have quiet time with Christ to reflect and to remember, we come to a bigger understanding of the tragedy, the upheaval, and the change that is going on in our world around us. When we have the Eucharist, we when we read the words of institution, Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me. And so I want to talk to you about what remembrance is, about remembering. Because we know it's important. Remembering is important for our understanding and uh, our being able to integrate what we've been through. But I like to think of the word when Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me, as not just thinking back fondly, because that's not really what he means. Thinking back fondly about something that happened 2,000 years ago Rather, it means remembering, rebringing back to life in our members, putting the body of Christ back together, remembering. Do this in remembrance of Christ. We take that in that sense, in that la the language, what that means when is when we remember Jesus 
in the Eucharist, when we remember the events of the Last Supper. It isn't just thinking fondly back. It's not a memorial meal. It means in this sacramental act, we're taking that which was happened in the temporal past thousands of years ago, but making it actually present and fully effective now and for all time. It, that moment transcends all of time. And just like when Jesus was on the walk, he was transcending time and space in his, in his resurrection. And he brought remembrance to these uh, sojourners that he walked with. My, my mentor in seminary, St. Saint, uh, Saint Albans in Washington, D.C., uh, the rector, uh, the Reverend Dr. Frank Wade, I need to give him credit because I'm going to use his story, uh, to, like to t use this analogy, and it always resonated with me, so I remember it, uh, and I, I call upon it. And he talks, when he's talking about uh, uh, our walk with Christ, and he went, he attended the Citadel, which is a military college in the South. And I remember tell, him telling a story once about how uh, when the big wigs were coming, whoever that was, uh, they were, they all got dressed in what the appropriate good formal attire that they wore. And they went out to wherever they gathered. I don't know, the parade grounds or wherever it is that they were gathering while they were waiting for the big wigs, the generals or whoever it was, the important guys were coming and so they were, they were all ready, but they hadn't, the, the big wigs hadn't showed up yet. And so they were just kind of milling around, talking to each other, you know, la da 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 da. Kind of like we do, we mill around while we're waiting for church to start, or we mill around while we're waiting for people to show up, whatever it is. And their commander or whoever came out and said, saw them milling about. And he says, look, if you're just going to mill about, Mill about smartly. And I, I got a chuckle out of that. Um, because when we mill about, we need to mill about the right way. Mill about smartly. Look, look like we're not just milling about. And so use that as an example to say, you know, we are not millers about of Jesus. We are followers of Jesus. Jesus is always walking somewhere. Jesus is always taking us somewhere. And so we don't get to just mill about, even if it's smartly. We are followers of Jesus, and that means we have to go, and we go, and go, and we go. And so as we walk with Jesus, it's impossible to just mill about in place. And so I, I do, I do love that. I do love that image. Um, remembering must take place for us to process what, the event and to reshape our anticipation of the event. When the rehearsal doesn't match what really happened, that's okay, we need to let go of the rehearsal. You know, that didn't go the way I thought it would. So we just need to try harder to do the exact same thing. This time it'll go right. That's not, that's not how it works. We have to try new ways to see the world through new eyes because Jesus has brought us to a new day. I want to share a story with you. Some of you will uh, resonate with this because you were here. Um, and you'll know who I'm talking about. Uh, but when I came here to visit uh, in the fall of 2015 to interview for my job here at St. Luke's, uh, I flew from El Paso to Billings. And though I had Skyped with uh, the search committee, you know, there were a lot of people in the picture. I didn't remember, really remember at that point who they were or whose name went with what. Uh, they maybe didn't really know exactly what I looked like, certainly what I was going to look like getting off a plane. And so I was looking around, and as I was coming down the escalator in the Billings Airport, I was looking around down at all the people and thinking, who are Lynn and Rose? 
because Lynn and Rose have been sent to fetch me from the airport. And I'm looking around, who are Lynn and Rose? Where are Lynn and Rose? I was looking around for two ladies. And all of a sudden, I spotted these two women down over there. I can still picture them. And they were looking around going, is that, they were looking up at the people coming out and getting on the escalator. Is that her? Is that her? And all of a sudden, when I saw them and they saw me and our eyes met, we knew you're the one. I pointed at them and they pointed at me. You're the one. We recognized you're the one I'm looking for. Uh, and so we met. We knew who we were. And I, I, I remember that story of fondness because it was, it was a fun way uh, to enter Billings. But also, I think about looking for Jesus. And we're looking around, is that Christ? Is that Christ? And often, maybe we don't recognize Christ until we see Christ looking back at us. Is that Christ? No. Is that Christ? No, that doesn't seem right. But there's someone looking for me. They're looking. They're looking for me. Christ sees me. I see Christ. And that's why I think of that story about Lynn and Rose. Uh, that we were looking for each other, and that's how we found each other. Jesus is looking for us just as much as we're looking for Jesus. Jesus approached, sought out, and joined the people on the road when they weren't looking for him. They thought he was gone. So because he was looking for them, they were able to look for and see him. So in this time when we are physically isolated, this doesn't have to be an Emmaus retreat. We can still have fellowship with Christ. We can still offer radical hospitality to the stranger and to one another. Breaking bread is important and it's good when we can do it together. But I think of that old saying, bidden or not, Christ is present. So let's invite him in. Let's share table fellowship. And our eyes will be opened. And then we can truly remember back on our journey. That Jesus has been on our journey with us all along. Amen. Please turn to page 96 and let us say together out loud the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And we will continue with the prayers on page 97. The Lord be with you and also with you. Let us pray in the words that our Lord Jesus himself taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Today we're going to do Suffrages A. I will do the verse, and you guys do the response but I'm going to do the response with you. Uh, please do the response out loud in Suffrages A. 
Show us your mercy, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. Clothe your ministers with righteousness. Let your people sing with joy. Give peace, O Lord, in all the world, for only in you can we live in safety. Lord, keep this nation under your care and guide us in the way of justice and truth. Let your way be known upon earth, your saving health among all nations. Let not the needy, O Lord, be forgotten, nor the hope of the poor be taken away. Create in us clean hearts, O God, and sustain us with your Holy Spirit. And this is the collect appointed for today, the third Sunday uh, in the Easter season. O God, whose blessed Son made himself known to his disciples in the breaking of bread, open the eyes of our faith that we may behold him in all his redeeming work, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We continue with a collect for Sundays and other collects. O God, you make us glad with the weekly remembrance of the glorious resurrection of your Son, our Lord. Give us this day such a blessing through our worship of you that the week to come may be spent in your favor through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. O God, the King Eternal, whose light divides the day from the night and turns the shadow of death into morning, drive far from us all wrong desires, incline our hearts to keep your law, and guide our feet into the way of peace, that having done your will with cheerfulness during the day, we may, when night comes, rejoice to give you thanks, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O God, the author of peace and lover of concord, to know you is eternal life, and to serve you is perfect freedom. Defend us, your humble servants, in all assaults of our enemies, that we, surely trusting in your defense, may not fear the power of any advers adversaries through the might of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Heavenly Father, in you we live and move and have our being. We humbly pray you so to guide and govern us by your Holy Spirit, that in all the cares and occupations of our life we may not forget you, but remember that we are ever walking in your sight. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O God, you have made of one blood all the peoples of the earth and sent your blessed Son to preach peace to those who are far off and those who are near. Grant that people everywhere may seek after you and find you. Bring the nations into your fold. Pour out your Spirit upon all flesh and hasten the coming of your kingdom. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The prayers of the people today are form two, which are on page 385 in your book of common prayer, page 385. You will not need your prayer book uh, for this these prayers, but you may follow along if you like to. There will be ample silence. Hopefully it's ample. If it's not, pray more later uh, for you to add your own prayers. So let us pray. I ask your prayers for God's people throughout the world, for our Bishop Marty, for this gathering, and for all ministers and people. Pray for the church. I ask your prayers for peace, 
for goodwill among nations, and for the well-being of all people. Pray for justice and peace. I ask your prayers for the poor, the sick, the hungry, the oppressed, and those in prison. Pray for those in any need or trouble. I ask your prayers for all who seek God or a deeper knowledge of God. Pray that they may find and be found by God. I ask your prayers for the departed and any whom you would like to name. Pray for those who have died. I ask your prayers for those on our prayer list, God knows their names, and any others you would care to lift up to God in prayer now. I ask your thanksgivings for anything you would like to lift up to God at this time. I am thankful for the squirrels, which keep me and my cats entertained. What would you like to lift to God at Thanksgiving? Praise God in, for those in every generation in whom Christ has been honored, especially those giving up of their own lives to help those who are sick and dying. And any others we would like to remember today. Pray that we may have grace to glorify Christ in our own day. Amen. Now, keeping your finger back earlier, I want you to turn even farther forward in your prayer book to page 821. Page 821. And I'd like you to join me in the prayer uh, with the responses for prayer for sound government. Prayer number 22 on page 821. O Lord, our governor, Bless the leaders of our land, that we may be a people at peace among ourselves and a blessing to other nations of the earth. Lord, keep this nation under your care. To the president and members of the cabinet, to governors of states, mayors of cities, and to all in administrative authority, grant wisdom and grace in the exercise of their duties. Give grace to your servants, O Lord to senators and representatives, to those who make our laws in states and cities and towns, give courage and wisdom and foresight to provide for the needs of all our people and to fulfill our obligations in the community of nations. 
Grace to us. Give grace to your servants, O Lord. To the judges and officers of our courts, give understanding and integrity, that human rights may be safeguarded and justice served. Give grace to your servants, O Lord. And finally, teach our people to rely on your strength and to accept their responsibilities to their fellow citizens, that they may elect trustworthy leaders and make wise decisions for the well-being of our society, that we may serve you faithfully in our generation and honor your holy name. For yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. Amen. And now turn forward again, please, to page 836. Page 836. And join, it with, join me in saying a general thanksgiving. Accept, O Lord, our thanks and praise for all that you have done for us. We thank you for the splendor of the whole creation, for the beauty of this world, for the wonder of life, and for the mystery of love. We thank you for the blessing of family and friends, and for the loving care which surrounds us on every side. We thank you for setting us at tasks that demand our best efforts, and for leading us to accomplishments which satisfy and delight us. We thank you also for those disappointments and failures that lead us to acknowledge our dependence on you alone. Above all, we thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, for the truth of his word and the example of his life, for his steadfast obedience by which he overcame temptation, for his dying through which he overcame death, and for his rising to life again, in which we are raised to the life of your kingdom. Grant us the gift of your Holy Spirit, that we may know Christ and make him known, and through Christ at all times and in all places, may give thanks to you in all things. Amen. And now, please turn back to page 102. Page 102. Please join me in saying out loud a prayer of St. Chrysostom. Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplication to you. And you have promised through your well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will be in the midst of them. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth and in the age to come life everlasting. Amen. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in the knowledge and love of God. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Alleluia, alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia. Glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia. Almost forgot my alleluia. That concludes our service of morning prayer for this morning. Uh, but if you'd like to stick around for a minute, I have some things to share uh, kind of about the life uh, our life as a uh, the parish of St. Luke's um, a letter will be going out tomorrow to explain uh, hopefully in pretty clear detail at least how we move forward into uh, beginning to return to in-person worship I know I said originally when this is all over we're going to have a big Easter celebration uh, that's not going to happen right away I think we'll probably be trickling back into in-person worship uh, and we will be following very strict uh, protocols to ensure that people stay safe when we do that. Uh, we plan to uh, both of the Saint, uh, both of the Billings parishes, St. Luke's and St. Stephen's, 
at this time plan to resume in-person worship on Sunday, May 24th. I know that's a month away, uh, but that is the prudent and smart thing to do, and that's a date we've chosen to be loving to, to all of our people. Um, I hope that won't be disrupted. I'm really looking forward to it as much as you guys are. Uh, we are going to continue to live stream evening prayer uh, uh, on Facebook. Um, our service will also continue to be live streamed even when we come back on Sunday mornings for in-person worship. Um, so when you get the letter, please look over it. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. Uh, as we know that uh, this returning is becoming a phased thing and uh, uh, we will continue to walk together though. So if you have any needs, please tell me or your Eucharistic visitor who's calling you. Uh, and you know, I got to tell you, I know people are really shy about inviting people to in-person worship, but now might be a good time to invite your friends to tune in to our worship, which is live streaming and available on Facebook and YouTube, also on Channel 7. So I'll share that with you. I miss you. I love you. And uh, take care of each other and walk in love as Christ loves us. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. And have a good Sunday. Bye-bye.